Hello and welcome to Indie Miners. Both 2022 and 2023 have delivered us some great remasterings of classic albums. This week is no exception. It marks the 30 year anniversary of Nirvana's final studio album, In Utero. We have BJ in Melbourne, who is a massive, massive fan of Nirvana. Give us a bit of a rundown, mate. Yeah, thanks, Al. Now, this album is in my top two albums of all time. So I hold the White Album and In Utero as my favourite albums of all time. So really, really pumped to hear that there was a a new edition. But I think that the interesting part for me, Al, is there was already a a super deluxe edition out in Mm. 2013. So it's only been 10 years. So it doesn't feel like a long time between editions. So Mm. always wondering to, to find out what the differences were. And I think going into that, what you get with the 2023 edition is effectively a lot more live tracks. So there is a 2023 remaster, as well as 53 unreleased live tracks. They've used AI to clean a lot of those up, so really to to be able to isolate particular parts of a a concert track. That's what you get with this particular edition, as opposed to the 2013 edition, which I, I found interesting really because of the Steve Albini alternative mixes, particularly for all apologies. So let me know in the comments if you agree. That that was very interesting. You don't get that on this particular mix. Now, it's all packaged up. There's various editions. Al, the most you're going to pay for this is $750 Australian. I don't know what that equates to in American dollars, but that is mm. quite a bit of money. Yeah, look, that's church change for people like you, mate. And and for the, those people watching, you know, there's plenty of money coming in. But please like and subscribe if you're enjoying our videos. That's a lot of money, mate. Now, 750 bucks. that's about three years worth of Spotify. Can you justify it? Now, it's interesting because I did read a lot of comments and people talking about this. And I thought there'd be a lot of kind of, oh, what a waste of money, blah, blah, blah. But a lot of people are pretty pumped about this, mate. So you you obviously must get some some points of difference here what do you kind of get here that's different from 2013 well look you get the uh, vinyl editions of the live album so they were talking about the premium premium edition so it's all focused on the vinyl stickers there's a booklet i mean god i mean they're expensive stickers right i think i think that um and, and, you know, you wouldn't want to actually peel them off and put them on the back of your car. Like, it's just that I just wouldn't want to go there. So I'd be interested to know who's actually doing that. Let me know in the comments. I feel like I've got a different read on this. I'm not sure yeah. if this is just overs. I think it's just, it's a lot of money. It's it's actually our $750 more than a Indie Miners subscription. See what I've done there? See what I've done like there? That. But I don't know. Maybe people, people won't subscribe for that. But... Uh, I, I don't know. I just I felt that that was a little bit over. Um, so, so can I ask? Do you get other than the LPs? Is there any point of difference between what you get on Spotify and in the pack? Not as I, I understand it. So not so there was the full suite of songs on Spotify. So just a disclaimer: yeah. we looked at the, the Spotify edition when um, reviewing this. But it was all there. So it was four hours worth. So I was listening to that basically all Friday. All of Saturday, uh, that was it was really cool to listen to um, in part. But I mean, our it was a twenty twenty three remaster, so so it yep. is an update. I just love listening to this album, so I, I, I you know any excuse that I've got to listen to it is great. So let, let, so let's talk about the remastering then. And now I'm going to let you take the lion's share of this conversation, mate, because you've listened to this album many, many times. Let's talk about the difference between the original and the remaster. Any particular highlights? Give us some thoughts. There. Look, I, unfortunately, I, I couldn't. I mean, I've listened to a few remasters and, and you can tend to hear a difference here and there. I, I could hear a couple of things at the low end, so really to the, to the bass Yep. and the drums you can sort of hear certain beats or, or, or certain um, instruments playing in a different way or it's revealing itself a little bit more than maybe the, uh, the previous version so it tends to happen with remasters I, I couldn't really hear anything for that and I, I must admit the album was made in reaction to Nevermind right so mm. it was always meant to be the Barter's view of the yeah. world and, and not yeah. meant to be a, a commercial opus. So that's why they got Steve Albini to do In Utero. And so it was, it was Butch Vig that produced Nevermind, that's right? Yeah? It, it was Butch Vig, yeah, that's, that's yeah. correct. So mm. 
Okay. For me, I just don't know if you can justify it. Like it, it, it was just, it, it was fine as it was. It was, it was made to sound dirty, and I don't know what a remaster actually does to that. So it just, it kind of, you know, it, it sort of, you don't see the point maybe of them doing that. And that's, I guess, why the 2013 package was interesting because it, it contained a version of a couple of songs that were discarded or were rejected by the our the company and they got Scott Lint in to I guess to do um, a, a little bit more of a patch up job on the songs that ended up being released as singles so okay. yeah I, I really I, you know that like I, I love the album like I, I listened to the album um, I, I don't know I, I really couldn't hear the difference let me know the comments I, I feel as if uh, maybe I just haven't haven't read the room on this one yeah, no, that's interesting, mate. But let's talk about the live tracks. So these aren't necessarily songs that weren't heard before. Is that right? Yeah, or that's right. Are I they mean, brand I'm, new? Like, uh, look, who knows? Like, I, I'm, I'm sure that these have been out on, on bootlegs. I, I, my first... Back in the day. Back in the day, they would have been... Um, back in where we used to live, uh, back in our hometowns, we, um, we could buy these live recordings for five bucks i don't know if you remember that al i do many many uh moons ago mate it was many moons ago but i mean they obviously were at a very good grade some of the recordings especially the ones probably the the 1994 ones but Mm. look quality wise i didn't mind it well i mean what do you think al Oh yeah, I thought I thought the particular rawness of uh, the man who sold the world, the classic David Bowie cover, compared to the unplugged version, which is you know a bit more uh, polished, was fantastic. But it also shows the the demise of not the demise, but the you know the final stages of Kurt Cobain, uh, where he was at. Um, and there's look, there's a couple of live tracks on there that I just kind of thought they're kind of painted by numbers here. I don't know if that's fair to say, and I'm probably going to get a bit heat in the good. comments, mate. No, I agree. Look, I, I, I feel as if, and, and this, this is stuff that I can remember having a conversation back in high school. This came back in high school. So it was a favourite album. And yeah. I, I can remember people sort of saying who also loved the album that you know, the, the quality of the live performances weren't so good. And I was, I was actually mm-hmm. puzzled by it because it just sounded like an amazing album and it, it just sounded amazing as a concert. But I, I feel as if, in some ways, they're just phoning it in. Like, I mean, things like it smells like Teen Spirit, for instance. Yeah. I mean, they, they're just. I mean, they don't want. It. They didn't want to do it by that stage. They had enough of it. They were sick to death of it. Um, it. It didn't feel as if they wanted to really be there now. And and I think that just sort of comes out in in the types of in the recording. I mean, you can't really um, do it justice with AI. You can't turn the, the I guess the energy levels up with AI it's only just going to clean the tracks up so I, I don't know maybe I'm reading the room wrong um, I did agree that man who sold the world and Jesus don't want me for a sunbeam I mean they're, they're the tracks that came off obviously on Unplugged so they recorded that or they, they, they put that out in the concert after they recorded MTV Unplugged mm. but look you listen to it once or twice and look I just got, can't really see myself going back to it and, and Nirvana have got a lot of live tracks out there now I mean they've got so many live recordings I mean that's all they can effectively do I mean they, they, they really they've you know the vaults are fairly much dry as I understand I, I, you're not going to hear any more Nevada songs or no good ones I think so yeah no look that's right mate and look, look to finish with let, let's talk about 1994 1993 94 as an era of music and for those kind of young people watching the show who might not really realise how volatile and how how angry kind of music was at that time. And I've got an interesting link with Steve Albini. So um, 1994, I bought about the Manic Street Preachers album, The Holy Bible, which I can kind of compare very similarly to In Utero. It was basically a very dark album. It was Richie Edwards, who was the lyricist, his final time with the band. And Steve Albini actually ended up producing the album Journal for Plague Lovers. So he's both produced In Utero and Journal for Plague Lovers by the Manic Street Preachers, which both have very similar kind of sounds. So there's your little uh, there's your little tidbit there, mate. But I, I just think for people watching that era of music and especially the final album of Nirvana's, it was it was raw, it was tough and they succeeded. It became a number one 
in America and many countries across the world. So to be able to do that on your third album, wanting to do something that wasn't necessarily commercially polished is a huge achievement. But my question for you, BJ, is is if Kurt Cobain was still around, would he want these box sets and flauntings of 10, 15, 30 year anniversaries or would he want Sleeping Dogs to Lie? What are your thoughts there? I don't know. People change, right? Like I think that back in the day, clearly not. You know, you wouldn't want that. I mean, in fact, the the whole notion that something is going to cost $750, like if you yeah. remember on Bleach, um, on the back cover of Bleach, it said that they recorded Bleach for 600 bucks. So, so you're going, oh, Bleach. That's right. So, so yeah, so... Um, but um, look, it does have a, a, a legacy. It was a risk by the band. Um, mm. It was not as commercial as Nevermind, but that didn't make it unlistenable. In fact, that it made it, I think, better. Um, I think sometimes, you know, I mean, I, I remember a couple of Payment albums um, in regards to this where, you know, Payment went in a different direction. They thought, oh, we're not going to be commercial anymore. We've had our hit. And they produced something that I, I just never, never liked. And some bands did that back in the 90s mm. as, as a reaction. Yep. Nirvana did yep. it, but didn't the way it should be. And, and look, I think the legacy of it, uh, especially where Albini, I mean, I mean, I'm sure Albini had his own techniques, but mm. yeah, for instance, the drumming and the sounding of the drums, that's, that's one thing that just, for me, it, it sounded so much different to what it came before it. And, you know, you could hear it, you know, it, could, it reverberates, like, and, and, and it's it's a much, much more influential album in my view than mm. Nevermind ever was. I think, I think bands, and a lot of Nirvana fans have, have seen that album as a superior album. Yep. No, well said, mate. And look, as you've mentioned throughout the show, please uh, please comment, please leave a like. We love a bit of banter here at Indie Miners, but that's our quick review of the 30-year remastering of Nirvana's In Utero. That wraps up another episode of Indie Miners. Please look to subscribe to the channel, follow us on Twitter, and let us know if there's an album you would like us to look at. So until next time, bye for now, and thank you for watching.